Welcome to Kingdom in Context. I'm Sean. I want to thank you for joining us here for our continuation on this Hebrew series, um, Understanding Hebrews. This is the Servant King. And I just want to thank everyone that's here in the live chat already. You guys are awesome. Hope you guys are enjoying this Sabbath. If that you guys are um, observing, if you've looked into the Sabbath and how it's a part of God's creation, it's a part of the covenant. He asks for us as believers to, to keep with him because he actually keeps it himself. So it's a very uh, unique blessing of a day that we just get to rest from our labors. Don't cause anyone else to labor before you and just, just chill, just relax, um, focus on him. And so he compares the coming kingdom and the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth as a Sabbath. Um, it's very interesting, very interesting concept because people will stop resting from their labors. It's going to be very interesting. Um, people will still be doing stuff. It's just, it won't be the rat race as it's colloquially termed in the United States. So it's going to be a very blessed time. There's peace on the earth. So thank you guys for being here. We're going to pick up back in Hebrews chapter seven. Now, originally I was wanting to do three chapters at a time in this particular book, but I started thinking about it as I was um, had, I had to postpone this particular episode a few times because of travel and different circumstances that came up in life. And I realized that the chapters seven, eight, nine, and 10 of Hebrews are some of the most misunderstood chapters in the entire Bible. It's some of the fodder, if you will, that people have used to create uh, alternate doctrines of how to express the Christian faith and what they, how they understand their identity and their good standing with Christ uh, to be because they take these particular four chapters wildly out of context. Um, it is <clears throat> fuel for ancient Gnostic preachings, which says that the Old Testament sacrifices were bad and the covenant in the Old Testament was somehow bad and different than the new covenant. And so they not not saying that the early Catholics that preached this new type of obedience to Christ were Gnostics, but it is the same influence of thought. Uh, they view the Old Testament um, way to worship God as somehow bad. And now through Christ, we have to worship him in a different way. Hebrews 7 through 10 is not saying that at all, at all. But this is what, like I said, four, these four chapters seem to be the most misunderstood in the entire Bible. And in modern Christendom, it's the most quoted out of context. People will cherry pick a verse here and there in one of these four chapters to try to draw an erroneous point. It happens all the time. I've had it in interviews, debates, conversations, my personal life. It's it's a it's a travesty, honestly. So I'm going to take my time with these four chapters. I'll probably dedicate a video, uh, one video per chapter, just so I can have plenty of time to address everything. But uh, I want to thank everyone that's here. Let's jump right into it. All right, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and a priest of God Most High. He met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And Abraham apportioned him a tenth of everything. The first, his name means a king of righteousness. Now, guys, I put in my parentheses here alternate interpretations of what this particular name, Melchizedek, means. Also can mean my king is right. Just for added, added information for, the, for those interested. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother or genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like son of God remains a priest for all time. I also included the translator insertion in here in blue. The word he, uh, the pronoun he, like the son of God, many translations will insert. This isn't in the Greek, but they'll insert into the text the pronoun he, and it'll read like the son of God, he remains a priest for all time. And so... This whole chapter is about to draw a comparison to you between the lifespan of the Levitical priest versus the uh, lifespan of the office of the Melchizedek. But if you didn't, if you read it without the inserted translator um, edition, it would just re it would just read because remember it's in the ancient Koine Greek they're all considered capital letters. There's no commas, punctuation. There's no periods. There's no quotations. So it would read very simply like this: First, his name means King of Righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace without father or mother life, like the son of God remains a priest for all time. Kind of a very different flow. Very interesting. Verse four, he says, consider how great Melchizedek was. Some people will say it's the Melchizedek. You know, let's, let's not quibble in the live chat, please. <laughs> consider how great the Melchizedek or the Melchizedek was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. 
Now the law commands the sons of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers, though they too are descended from Abraham. So as as in the previous installments in the series, let's go and let's take a couple verses or even a verse at a time, and let's just look really break this down and see. This first verse here, the Melchizedek was king of Salem, priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham apportioned to him a tenth of everything. So Abraham is paying a tithe. This is Genesis 14, 17 through 20. This is the valley um, of Shittim. This is the, the slaughter of the kings is referring to the, um, the battle of the nine kings that you see with Ketelaomer and Tidal and some other people. So it says in verse 17 in Genesis 14, after Abraham returned from defeating Ketelaomer and the kings that allied with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shavad, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine since he was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Now I'm going to go on to show you guys that Abraham, uh, during his lifespan, was also a priest of God. But it's interesting because this falls right in line with God's eternal instructions, what we would, you know, Culturally, you might call it the internal Torah. It's the internal instructions for right behavior on the earth. And the priests, the lesser priests, were supposed to tie the tenth to the high priest. So I've emphatically tried to show in previous installments, previous videos, discussions, and debates for years that Abraham was a priest of God. In this particular moment in his life, this is even before his name changed, before it became Abraham. He is not a most high priest. He is, um, I don't even know if he's a priest yet. I have a, have, an, I have a hinting that this possibly could be the moment where he receives the blessing of the priest, but it doesn't show that in the text. It just says he gets blessed by this most high priest or this uh, high priest. But he is doing the Torah. He is doing the proper thing as a lesser priest to go to someone he submits to an authority who is a high priest of God most high, and he gives a tenth to that high priest. So this, we're watching Torah happen right here. Abraham is following God's instructions for righteousness. So I think it's interesting. Um, we don't see any other uh, anything fleshed out here, anything greater in the Book of Jubilees. But here's the additional account in the Book of Jubilees, chapter 13, 25 through 27. For Abraham and for his seed, a tenth of the first fruits to the Lord, and the Lord ordained it as an ordinance forever, that they should give it to the priests who serve before him, that they should possess it forever. And to this law, there's no limit of days. Oh, wait, does it say, and to this law, um, the limit of days is until the writer of Hebrews writes chapter 7 or chapter 8? Or until Christ dies and resurrects? Or until Christ at the Last Supper holds up the cup and says, this is the blood of the new covenant? Is that when the limit of days on this law happens? Or is it forever? Is it ordained for the generations forever? that they should give to the Lord the tenth of everything, and the seed and the wine and the oil and of the cattle and of the sheep. Verse 27, he gave it unto his priests to eat and drink with joy before him. Now this is the, even though it doesn't even use the word Melchizedek in Jubilees 13's um, account, he, in verse 27, is the reference to who received the tithe from Abraham. It is the Melchizedek. And then in turn it says he gave it to his priests. So again, there's a priesthood. There's lesser priests under the authority of the high priest. That's why you have a high priest, because he it denotes a difference in a hierarchical structure of leadership and lesser priests there under his authority. So it's very, you know, a little bit of hopefully some good contextual background understanding for the priesthood. <laughs> it's not a singular isolated position. In the same way at the resurrection, glorified saints will be brought into the priesthood under Christ in the Melchizedek order to serve, to rule and reign with him over the nations for a thousand years, because Christ will be the high priest in that priesthood. Just like in the Levitical priesthood, the sons of Aaron were nominated through lineage of succession to be the high priests, and the others could be lesser priests. So it's very important to understand these little types of uh, details so that you understand there's a reason when they call someone a high priest. The, the very name assumes there's lesser priests under his care. We have in Jubilees a, a, a testimony to that concept, that hierarchical structure. So in Numbers 18.21, then we actually have this 
repeated to the Israelites who were under Moses' care, Moses and Aaron's care. And this is Numbers 18, 21. Behold, I've given to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work they do, the service of the tent of meeting. So that means what's the purpose of this tithe being given from the Levites to the sons of Aaron? Or excuse me, what's the purpose for the people and even the priests themselves? But what's the purpose for the general tithe, the tenth, to be given to the priests and the and the, those who do service in the tent of meeting? So is it right for us to retroactively assume that the lesser priests under the Melchizedek in Ju Genesis 14 and Jubilees 13 also cared for some sort of structure where the high priest ministered? Make sure it's clean, make sure it's protected, make sure it's maintenance. If there's a strong windstorm, something, you know, tent pole falls over, gets out of joint, they make sure it's proper. So this is their job to maintenance the place, to make sure it's functioning so that the the priesthood can come in the not just the lesser priest, but the but the high priest that could come in and make sure he can do his service properly to yahweh so there's practical reasons for this tithe it's not so that the temple and the priests could get wealthy that's an abuse there's a practical reason for the tithe so in the same way abraham decided he needed to tithe to the mechizedek it's the law of the lord Melchizedek ministers, he approaches the altar of the Lord and ministers. So therefore, there's a practical reason why he would receive the tithe, which is a monetary wealth of, of various various kinds, and then turn that into usable wealth to maintain the, the place where he serves. Verse Further in, in verse 2, it says, And first his name means king of righteousness. That's all. So my king is peace. Excuse me, my king is right, like I said. Righteousness means right behavior. I don't see a big you know, discrepancy in alternate translations. Some other people think it should say my king is right or king of righteousness. It's fine. It means the same thing. Righteousness means you're doing right behavior. So therefore you would be quote unquote right. Without father or mother or genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God remains a priest for all time. So I just want to denote here, he, Christ remains a priest for all time. Active present tense. Christ remains a priest for all time. So this is trying to show you a comparison between the Levites and the Melchizedek order. There's two orders. Forget the name Aaron. Forget the forget Zadok. Forget Phineas. Those are people inside of an order. Think about the orders. Two orders. There is a Melchizedek order that was functioning from Adam down to the point of Levi. And then once Levi got it, the requirement for the order became based on descendancy, who your mother and father were instead of you're uh, appointed and ordained because you knew the, knew the law and knew the Torah and were righteous more than most people. So you're qualified for it. So this, there's a difference. The order of Aaron, based on descendancy, had a, had a span where people would die off. The order of Melchizedek was intended that they would hold that office until they died. So uh, the other one, I believe uh, they would transfer it before they die. Um, and in fact, if I'm not I'm mistaken, I, I don't think he was 50 because I know Aaron was much older after that time. I think the lesser priests did like a 25 year service, but the high priest would try to keep it as long as he could. But he still before he died, he would transfer it. But the Melchizedek, the idea that it's comparing you now, the, the priesthood that Christ is in is a priesthood where he's going to keep this forever because he doesn't die. It's going to go on a few verses later to explain that. But there's a difference. That's why, again, right here, he remains a priest for all time. Now, the reason why I'm going to point this out repetitively throughout this particular chapter's overview is because the arguments that we hear today is that Christ's priesthood was given to him, fulfilled, and basically nullified the moment he died on the cross. They will claim, that's just one argument. Other arguments claim that he received his priesthood at his baptism, walked it and fulfilled it out through his earthly life, and then, quote-unquote, made atonement through his moniker of being called a priest through his death on the cross, and then once he's in heaven now, he's not a priest anymore. All of that's nonsense. All of that doesn't match with the actual words that he only received his priesthood after he resurrected and ascended to heaven's temple. 
that's where he is appearing as a high priest. That is where he's ordained in a temple. In order to be ordained as a high priest of God, according to this, there has to be an actual structure that the priest can go to and stand for seven days while he's been anointed. And this is a part of um, this is just a part of the process that the Creator of heaven and earth outlined for how he ordains his ministers who approach his altar. It's a seven day process, and there has to be a temple that they can stand at the doorway of. So it's very interesting that. Um, people make this erroneous claim because they um, are so unfamiliar with the Old Testament that they'll try to say, well, Christ's earthly life was his priesthood, and at his death, he accomplished atonement, which that, again, is not, that's, a, that's we, we understand how the, that phrase is used in the New Testament, Romans and Corinthians and other places, that his death accomplishes expi expiation of sins for us, but there's furthering process to that short descriptor, and this is what Hebrews is emphatically breaking down through all these chapters is that there's an ongoing process. There's a furthering uh, description of why Christ got his priesthood after his resurrection and ascension to heaven, why he's ministering in the temple in heaven above, and how that is creating atonement for you for the covering of your sins. And at the appointed time with the resurrection, it'll be the removal of your sins when he gives you your new heart and your new body. So there's a there's a process that all of that gets kind of glazed over with short little statements like the blood of the eternal covenant or we're sprinkled in the blood of Christ or the blood of Christ washes away our sins. If you were a first century Hebrew or an Israelite with the standing temple there and you knew how atonement was made through a priesthood and then you saw the Messiah everyone's been anticipating show up and the scriptures say that he's going to be made a priest in heaven's temple you would know exactly what that means because you have the example of it on the earth. You would never think that his literal death on the cross did the work that the priests do in an ordained temple. You would understand the metaphor that his death on the cross got him to his priesthood. His priesthood is given to him in heaven where he ministers in the Father's temple to create atonement. All that is summed up in the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. So you again, this this these short phrases, these short idioms, these short metaphors and comparisons assumes you know the front of your Bible. And this is the biggest problem with many um, modern communities of Christians today is that we are not told to read the front of our Bible. And if we are told to read it, we're not told to take it seriously. We're told that, oh, it's just a, you know useful little anecdotes that you can think on, maybe find a good moral lesson out of. But never... Are they encouraged to take the words seriously? As in, you need to know this so that you can understand the end of the Bible. You, we see lots. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'll stop right there. But this is the idea of emphatically here in verse three, the writer of Hebrews keeps reminding us, just like he has in chapter two, chapter three, chapter five, chapter six. Again, in chapter seven, he's going to keep reminding us the Son of God is a priest for all time. He's never going to lose his appointment as high priest like mortal men did because they would die or be passed on through secession. Verse four, consider how great Melchizedek was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, this word great here has to do with his being a high priest. Again, you, in order to be just like Christ says in Matthew 5, 18 and 19, those who are great in the kingdom of heaven are those who do the commandments and teach others to do them. Those who are least in the kingdom be those who speak against the commandments and teach others not to do them. So this means when you when you have the word great referencing to a priest, it doesn't mean that he was a celebrity. It doesn't mean that he was some sort of idolized icon. No, it means he was extremely faithful to God's commandments. That's what earned him the role as high priest. He was better at it than everyone else. That gave him the authority to be ordained to, to teach others how to repent and do the instructions of God. This is the, uh, this is the uh, context and the definition of this concept of consider how great Melchizedek was. So the whole concept is now it's comparing the Melchizedek that Abraham tithed to as someone that was extremely righteous in doing the commandments of God, even though first century Hebrews and Israelites, they, you know, they, they nearly idolized Abraham because he was also considered extremely righteous and faithful to God's commandments as we you know as we see in Genesis 26:5 he 
he this is why the Pharisees are boasting, you know, oh, we're <clears throat> we are we are the sons of Abraham. And Christ is like, yeah, actually, your your sons is your father, the devil, because if you were sons of Abraham, you would be doing the deeds of Abraham. And you at that point, you would be called great. You would be called one righteous. This is why he tells us in Matthew 5 20, if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, our righteous, our right behavior must exceed that of the Pharisees because they were unrighteous. They were hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, liars, vipers. They weren't righteous, but they claimed a righteous man as their ancestor, Abraham, without following Abraham's example of obedience to God. So here is just giving you another little, another little uh, comparison. So this is why. I opened up this video explaining that chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 of Hebrews are probably the four most difficult passages in the entire Bible. It's the four most, it's, it's these four chapters confuse Christians the most and are taken out of context and poorly taught and horrible, erroneous conclusions are drawn from these four chapters. But when we just kind of slow down, look at, look at where these um, references are being drawn from, from the Old Testament, it kind of defines some of our terms. We start to really see that the writer of Hebrews through and through is trying to share with you that Christ is still ministering God's law on your behalf. And this is why you can be rest assured your resurrection is coming. This is why he starts out in verse one of chapter 11 to express that faith is things that we hope for, but are unseen because he's trying to build your faith for 10 chapters, expressing to you that Christ will never fail you. Christ is greater than Abraham. Christ is greater than the Melchizedek priest to whom Abraham tithed. He's trying to build your faith this whole time. So in verse 4, consider how great Melchizedek was. Cons let, me, let me translate it to its literal, literal intent. Consider how incredibly faithful to the commandments Melchizedek was. Even the patriarch Abraham, who was also incredibly faithful to the commandments throughout his whole life, he gave him a tenth of the plunder, which means he submitted to the authority of the high priest of Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, because Abraham was faithful. And this is what you're supposed to do if you're not the high priest. You're just a lesser priest. Verse 5, now the law commands the sons of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers, though they too are descended from Abraham. Let's, well, I'll just start. So the law, this again goes, we already read it again from Numbers 18. We already read it, the idea from Jubilees 13. But the law commands the sons of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, from their brothers, though they are too descended from Abraham. So basically he's he's going into here, to, he's kind of drawing, man, I wish I had some sort of like unique animation to show the literary way that the writer of Hebrews is bouncing in a timeline between comparisons. He goes in this timeline to compare back to Genesis 14, King of Salem, to Abraham, because imagine Abraham in the center of a timeline. And before Abraham, he bounces in a comparison back to this Melchizedek who was older than Abraham and greater in obedience than Abraham. And then goes forward to Levi, the great grandson of Abraham, who hadn't even been born yet, to explain that the law that was given at Sinai, which is the same law that Abraham and this Melchizedek followed, and the same one that Jacob followed in Genesis 30, that same law that we see the descendants of Levi, who's Levi, who wasn't born yet, because remember, Abraham's in the center of the timeline, four generations lower, you know, after Isaac, Jacob, and then Levi is born. And then two to 300 years later, the descendants of Levi at Mount Sinai have these instructions repeated to them because they had forgotten most of it being enslaved in Egypt for 80 years. This is why this chapter confuses people so much. The writer of Hebrews expects you to know the Old Testament intimately, inside and out, thoroughly. Like you could go on a game show trivia quiz and answer all the questions. Like he expects you to know the front of your Bible very well. In fact, it's almost since the book is titled Hebrews, it's almost as if he's written it to a people that grew up in a culture, understanding these things and being taught these things since the moment they could speak. And here we come along thousands of years later in a totally different culture, speaking a different language, never having learned this stuff before since the moment we grew up. And we're trying to play catch up on this knowledge, on this understanding, on this cultural uh, ingrained 
understanding of what who priests are, what they do, how they function. And this and in comparison to one of the patriarchs who also was a prophet and a priest. So it becomes a learning curve. We're playing catch up. But the writer of Hebrews doesn't give you a lot of time to catch up. <laughs> like he like we talked about in the previous installment in chapter five, at the end of chapter five, he says, I'd like to tell you more. Like he was talking about Christ's priesthood, why Christ prophesied to be a high priest forever in the Melchizedek order. And he goes, he's like, I'd like to tell you more, but you guys are, you guys are dull of understanding. And you guys are still on milk. I can't give you the meat. Even on the milk, there's many of us in, in church today, we're, we're not even ready for the milk. What the writer of Hebrews is calling milk, most people don't even understand and take wildly out of context. And come to these erroneous doctrines and conclusions. So I hope through this series to get us all up to being able to understand the milk. So he goes on to say, now the law commands the sons of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people that is from their brothers, though they too are descended from Abraham. So this is, again, is just hopping forward in this little timeline to show another comparison 400 plus years later, to the sons of Levi under Moses' care, being instructed about how to tithe properly because they had been in Egypt, generations raised in Egypt, not being able to follow God's instructions, not being able to sacrifice or, or walk out their priesthood in the land of Goshen. And now they're free to do that, and they need to be retaught the covenant of the Lord. This is why in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 through 20, Yahweh is explaining to them, if you do these and choose life, this is the same covenant I offer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very important. So we go on to verses 6 through 12. But Melchizedek, who did not trace his descendant from Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And indisputably, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the case of the Levites, mortal men collect the tenth, but in that case, one of whom it is witnessed that he lives. And so to speak, Levi, and this is important, right? This is our, this has actually been translated into a modern little phrase, you know, modern term of a phrase, and so to speak. So basically he's saying this is a metaphor or this is some sort of allusion to Levi who collects the tenth. He paid the tenth through Abraham. Now, obviously Levi wasn't born yet. He's four generations lower than Abraham. He's not born yet. Of course he didn't pay the tenth to the Melchizedek through Abraham. This is just a figure of speech. This is a, a type of, I don't even know exactly what literary term this would be, but this is just the writer of Hebrews trying to explain because Levi was in the loins of, Michal of Abraham, when Abraham paid the tithe to this great Melchizedek and got blessed by him, it's like Levi was there too. That's all he's trying to say because he's trying to draw the modern day readers who respected the descendancies of Levi into the understanding of Abraham following these same instructions and being blessed by this Melchizedek. So, because again, he's comparing a Melchizedek priesthood to a mortal Levite priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood was that you were intended to have it forever until you died. So therefore, if you don't die, you have it forever. Versus what they knew at the time, which was a Melchizedek or which was a Levite priesthood filled with mortal men who die. So he's trying to draw and, and connect these ideas so that the reader in the first century, who was raised in cultural, uh, in cultural Israel, raised with the temple, raised with the Levites ministering at the temple, whom they were the leaders of the people, to draw this understanding of this is the Melchizedek, he flowed in the same law. The only difference was he could his position was intended to be forever. That priesthood is forever. This is at the resurrection. We're not put into a Levitical priesthood. We're put into a priesthood that is intended to be forever. The Melchizedek version, because we will live forever at the resurrection. We get the eternal life, the John 3.16 promise. You see the difference? We're not, we're not made priests to rule and reign with Christ as Levitical priests. Those are for mortal men who come and go, who die, who spring up and, and wither like the flower. So, verse 10, for when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the loin of his ancestor. Now, if profession could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on this basis, the people received the law, why was there still need for another priest to appear? One in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed as well. This is, this is probably one of the 
biggest little segments here, and I'm happy to go through it and break it down. So let's look at verse six. But Melchizedek, who did not trace his descendants from Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And indisputably, the lesser is blessed by the greater. What did we just discuss about the idea of being less least in the kingdom? The lesser in the kingdom versus the greater in the kingdom. It's all about who does the commandments and teaches others to do them. If you do the commandments and teach others to do them, you are called great in the kingdom. If you do the opposite, you try to make null the commandments and teach others not to do them, you'll be least in the kingdom. So the greater is the Melchizedek, who blessed Abraham the lesser. Now, at the end of Abraham's life, he's been he's being um, commended by Yahweh for being extremely faithful. But let's be honest, guys. We see some moments throughout Abraham's life where he makes some mistakes. I mean, he goes into you know Egypt and lies to Abimelech about his wife and causes plague to come upon the household of the royals in Egypt until they release Sarah back to him. And, you know, this is in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. I mean, he had some moments. He had some moments of fear, some moments of doubt, some moments of failure. We all do, right? Abraham was not Christ. So it's okay in this moment that Abram is standing before the Melchizedek. Abram is considered lesser in faithfulness to God than this man he's tithing to because that's the way it should be. The elder should have this walk down better. That's the way it should be. So in verse eight, well, actually let's look at this prophecy real quick about Levi. It's from the Testament of Levi verses eight, one through 10. It says, and there again, I saw a vision as the former, after we had spent there 70 days, and I saw seven men in white raiment saying to me, Arise, put on the robe of the priesthood and the crown of righteousness, the breastplate of understanding, the garment of truth, and the plate of faith, and the turban of the head, and the ephod of prophecy. Now, the reason I'm, I'm showing you that this in this ancient Israelite writing, which is was included in the Armenian canon in the 15th century and, and part of the Dead Sea Scroll findings, um, rejected by first century rabbis who also rejected Christ, they rejected the Testament of Levi. It has prophecies of Christ in here. And also has the history of Levi before Mount Sinai receiving a priesthood. So since modern, since first century Judaism idolized Moses and Mount Sinai, and they claimed the law was only given then, well, it makes sense that they would get rid of this book. Because this book refutes their claims. Because it shows right here in verses 1 through 2 that the angels that showed up gave a priesthood with all the same descriptions the, they put on the robe of priesthood, the crown of righteousness, the breastplate of understanding, the garment of truth, the plate of faith, the turban on the head, the ephod of prophecy, all the stuff we see in Exodus 28 that's given to the priests of Aaron and his sons. It's the same law, guys. The law of God's eternal. That means for the priests as well. And yes, we're going to we're going to address verse 12 where it uses the word change. So verse 3 says, they, they severally carried these things and put them on me and said to me, from now on, become a priest of the Lord you and your seed forever. So this is the transition moment. This is why the Testament of Levi is in the library in the first century of the person writing the book of Hebrews. He's got the Testament of Jubilees and the Testament of Levi. He knows the story of where the priesthood came from. He knows it's not what the rabbis of that day started making up this new narrative which their timeline of the law being given started at Mount Sinai. He knew the difference. It's very different. There was a history there. There was always a priest on the earth from Adam down. And then by the time I get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob had a son named Levi. Angelic visitation shows up. This is attested, attested to in both Jubilees and the Testament of Levi. I'm just showing you the, the passage here from the Testament of Levi for now. And they anointed the son of Jacob, whose name was Levi, as a priest, and then said, you and your seed will be priests forever. So now the priesthood in Israel, remember Levi was the son of a, a man named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So now within the clan and the tribe of Israel, on the earth, you have Levi is the priest to God. And then his descendants after him will be. So it's no longer an ordainment based on um, who's the best candidate. 
Now it's based on ancestry, genealogical requirement. Are you of the tribe of Levi? Now they were still inherently supposed to choose someone who was willing to walk in the ways of Yahweh, but unfortunately, it did not follow that pattern once you get into the furthering apostasy of Israel later on. But we'll, we'll expound on that here in just a little bit. Verse 4, and the first anointed me, the first this first angelic man who's who's giving this to this priest to, to Levi, the first anointed me with holy oil and gave to me the staff of judgment. Same thing we see done with Aaron, Leviticus 8. The second washed me with pure water and fed me with bread and wine, even the most holy things, and clad me with a holy and glorious robe. Now, is it a coincidence that in his ordainment ceremony, he gets fed bread and wine and gets blessed? Is it a coincidence that that's the same language we see in Genesis 14 when Abraham meets the Melchizedek? That's why I said I have an inkling to think this could be the moment in Genesis 14 when Abraham gets blessed and becomes a lesser priest under the authority of the Melchizedek. But it doesn't directly say that, so that would just be my speculation. So in verse 5, the second washed me with pure water, fed me with the bread and wine, even the most holy things, and clad me with the holy and glorious robe. Verse 6, the third clothed me with a linen vestment like an ephod. Verse 7, the fourth put me round, put round me a girdle like unto purple. Number 8, the fifth gave me a branch of rich olive. Now, guys, this, this verse 7, the fourth put round me a girdle like unto purple. This isn't the underwear that the Mormons wear. <laughs> the, the, do you guys think that the same uh, adornments of priestly garments for the Melchizedeks is going to be the same? And I'll show you in a minute. But Jacob, Jacob filled his, you know, put on the the garments on the Levi. We're going to read that in Jubilees in a minute. But this would be the same garments that the Melchizedek wore in Genesis 14, because again, God's law is eternal. This is the same garments that your high priest in a Melchizedek order in heaven, Christ Jesus, wears. This Again, God's law is eternal. He doesn't just make up arbitrary laws for different people. He's not inconsistent. So just another quick little, you know, another quick little way here to dispel the invented priesthood of Mormonism. Um, number eight, the fifth gave me a branch of rich olive. Number nine, the sixth placed a crown on my head. Number 10, the seventh placed on my head a diadem of priesthood and filled my hands with incense that I might serve as priest to the Lord God. Again, we see this in uh, Exodus chapter 30. We see this in Leviticus chapter 9. We see this, the, the priests who are angels in heaven in Revelation chapter 5, bringing forward the incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Uh, so this means that they are also receiving prayers in the days of Levi from the people because they're mediators to God on the people's behalf. And as we read back in Jubilees 13, the Melchizedek gave the food to his priests to eat it and be filled with joy. That means there was other priests. We don't know how many, but there was other priests under this high priest who also interacted with the people to teach them righteousness and to receive their um discussions and their confessions and their repentance and to teach them how to walk in the ways of the Lord and to bring their prayers forward to the Father with this process of incense in a temple. Again, God's ways are consistent. So this is the Testament of Levi, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Looking over here on the left-hand side, Hebrews 7, 6, but Melchizedek, who did not trace his descendant from Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him with the promises. And indisputably, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So this is a, just, again, tying into this idea of the reader in the first century in the book who's reading the letter of Hebrews, who would be an Israelite, who understands the Levitical process in the temple, who's being told by first century rabbis, oh, hey, the law only came at Sinai and the priesthood only came through Aaron. That's when it started. He's being encouraged. Hey, wait, wait, it goes much deeper than this. Just like the rabbi I interviewed on my channel a few years ago when I asked him about Malachi chapter 2, which talks about the promise that God, Yahweh gave to Levi for the priesthood. He said, oh, it's up for interpretation. He wanted to ignore it. So to me, that's, 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 um, that's wild. Why would you want to ignore that? It's in the a prophet, Malachi. 
but they view the those minor prophets as interpretive not for interpretation we don't have to take it seriously it's not it may not be true history because modern day rabbinic judaism idolizes the first five books and they think if it's not in there then it's up for interpretation so therefore he ignores the prophet malachi talking about the history of the ordainment of levi hundreds of years before mount sinai in the same way they ignore the testament of levi in the same way they ignore the book of jubilees which also talks about the ordainment of levi so the writer of hebrews who doesn't believe like rabbinic judaism who confesses christ is also explaining the deep history of the priesthoods back from the melchizedek to the levites and then to Christ. So he, you're, you're, this information here would cause a rabbinic Pharisee in the first century would cause their head to spin and pop off. They would, their cognizance would, would cause spontaneous combustion. This is information that the people sorely needed to know back then and today. So if we go here further, Jubilees thirty-two. Verses 1, 3, and verse 9, we see this parallel account of Levi being ordained with the priesthood, but it has some unique other information as well. So in verse 1, it says, And Jacob abode that night at Bethel. Where was the tabernacle held for over 400 years after the days of Moses before uh, Solomon built the temple? It was held at Bethel, which means the house of God. Jacob abode that night at Bethel, and Levi dreamed that they had an ordained and they had ordained and made him the priest of the Most High God, him and his sons forever. And he awoke from his sleep and blessed the Lord. Verse 3 goes on to say, And in those days Rachel became pregnant with her son Benjamin. So now we have a timeline about when this happened. And Jacob counted his sons from him upwards, and Levi fell to the portion of the Lord. And his father clothed him in the garments of the priesthood and filled his hands. What do we read back from the ordination? of these angels and this vision that Levi was having, that they filled his hands with the bread and the wine and all the garments of the priesthood. That was in the vision. Now that's physically literally happening from his father, handing him the priesthood and the physical literal garments and everything involved. Very interesting. Jubilees 32 verse nine goes on to say, and Levi discharged the priestly office at Bethel before Jacob, his father in preference to his 10 brothers. And he was a priest there. And Jacob gave his vow. Therefore, he tithed again the tithes of the Lord and sanctified it, and it became holy unto him. Now, this is wild because now you have a younger man who's 18 at the time, receives the priesthood of Yahweh, and his father now starts tithing to him because that's what you do. You go tithe to the priesthood at the, at the place where the, father, the Yahweh has his name, which was the tabernacle at Bethel. At this time, by the way, all this mentioning of Bethel, calling it the house of God, where the um, before the temple was built in Jerusalem, uh, from my understanding, post flood up until Solomon's day, priests administered um, at Bethel. It seems like they administered the, the 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 priesthood at Bethel, or as as the wording here says in verse nine, they discharged the priestly office at Bethel. That's what leads me to believe that was the general location of the Garden of Eden before it was removed from the earth just in the way that the father in all of his word throughout all of his other prophets he loves to name things like very on the nose so Bethel translates as the house of god the garden of eden was the house of god so this is why and then and here is where all his ministers uh, minister to him in a town called the house of god so and it was on a hill so i just this is why my speculation again but this is why i would think that before the flood this would have been the the gps location of the garden of eden so in verse 8 of hebrews 7 in the case of the levites mortal men collect the tenth but in that case one of whom it is witnessed that he lives so this is this is actually just another little moment here of Again, reminding you that the Levites are mortal men. That means their office is going to be transferred to somebody else. It's going to be changed. A new guy is going to come in and pick over, take over the priest, the high priest position because the old one has died. Because they're mortal. But even the mortal men collect a tenth from the people. 
So that's it's, it's very interesting. So he's just trying to give a, a quick comparison back to the idea of this this moment with Abraham and the Melchizedek, as, a, as because the whole the whole concept in these first eight verses, or actually most of the first half of chapter seven, is he's comparing the two priesthoods, the two offices, not specifically individual people, but the two offices in how they function. What are their requirements? For the Levites, they're mortal men. The, uh, the ordination and the appointment was based upon descendancy. Who's your mother and father? Genealogy. The Melchizedek, it wasn't. It was based upon righteousness. You had to be righteous. You had to be, quote-unquote, right. And it was also considered someone who's a king, who's a ruler. So even though the, the Levites in the days of Israel, they were rulers of the people, they also they weren't always a king. So this is a, or they were never a king. They had kings sprouted up later, but the Melchizedek is someone who's a king. He needs also a high priest who's righteous. And so this is why it's a perfect, wonderful office of priesthood that Christ can step into because he's both king and high priest. So with the Levites, he's trying to say, this is, you know, mortal men collected the tenth in that case, one of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So this is, it's just a, a drawing another comparison back to this moment and a, a contrast between the two offices of priesthood. So in verse nine, and so to speak, Levi who collects the 10th paid the 10th through Abraham. For when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the loin of his ancestor. Now in this type of analogy he's making, he could have made it with Phineas or Zadok or what's his name, Merami or, or any of the other descending Levite high priests of Aaron, he could have made the same allusion if he wanted to, saying that, oh, because those people were the ancestors of Abraham and still in the loins of Abraham, because Levi wasn't technically in the loin of Abraham, was he? He came from Jacob. Remember, Ishmael and Isaac came from Abraham. Out of Isaac came Jacob. Out of Jacob came Levi and the additional 11 sons. So even in the figure of speech here, it's not literal because it's not factual to be literal. It's an, it's an allegory type statement. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. This is the moment here in Genesis 14, 18 through 20, like we just read. This is the moment where after the battle, Melchizedek was, came out with the blessing, the bread and the wine for Abraham, and Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Now, I want to kind of dive in and, and into this moment here with Abraham and why it's so important that he's being referenced in this moment. Not only is it because he's a priest who is submitting to the Melchizedek, the high priest, and they're both in the Melchizedek order, and that the point of Levi, where the requirements for the priesthood changed, we're going to get to verse 12. Please stick with us. This is why he's mentioning that, that he keeps comparing the two priesthoods because the Levite priesthood was a point of change. Now with Christ and his priesthood, there's another point of change. So this is why he's continuing to draw this historical information for you and um, compare and contrast the different priesthoods leading up to the point of change. Because before then, it was all Melchizedek priesthoods. And the requirements were slightly different until you get to the point of Levi, and there's a point of change. All right, so verse 26, 5, 26, 5 of Genesis, Abraham listened to my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. The word charge, kept my charge, this is a word, I think it's mesmarti in the Hebrew, and it's a word for uh, discharging the priestly office. He kept the charge of Yahweh. He was a, high he was a priest, excuse me, in the Melchizedek order. So was Isaac. So was Jacob. They may not have been the high priests. They're still in the order. And so then from Levi comes a new order for mortal men that will, based upon their genealogy and not upon angelic appointment. So it's very interesting. As there was a it was a change based and of course this was the idea that they were already instructed to, to teach their children to walk in the ways of the Lord and admonish them with all the commandments and instructions of the Lord. But when they failed to do that and still anointed one of them as priest, 
it became a travesty. It became a shame. It became Yahweh's name being profaned among the nations. Jubilees 21, 14 through 16. Verse 14 says, Besides these kinds of wood, there is none other that you shall place on the altar, for the fragrance is dispersed, and the smell of its fragrance goes not up to heaven. Observe this commandment and do it, my son, that you may be upright in all your deeds. And at all times be clean in your body and wash yourselves with water before you approach to offer on the altar and wash your hands and your feet before you draw near to the altar. When you are done sacrificing, wash again your hands and your feet. In Jubilees chapter 21, this is Abraham teaching Isaac and Ishmael how to sacrifice. Because he's a priest, like I just showed you from Genesis 26, 5, he kept the charge of Yahweh. He discharged the priestly office. He kept the charge of Yahweh. So he even explains even that he learned this stuff in the book of Enoch, by the way. Which I would say is not the same collection of writings of Enoch that we have today. But this is what Abraham is claiming where he learned the priestly office. And, and this is this specific detail of the priestly office. But I want to point out here the idea of approaching. This is what he talks about, and he's, in, he's explaining the process of the right kind of wood for sacrifice and when you approach the altar. Look at that language, because we see it in Jubilees 15.30 as well. For Ishmael and his sons and his brothers and Esau, the Lord did not cause them to approach him, and he chose them not because they are children of Abraham, because he knew them, but he chose Israel, Jacob, to be his people. So this is a further detail of breaking down uh, the idea that Ishmael, obviously, as we know, Ishmael and Esau were not going to be um, given the priesthood. Israel, or Jacob, he was the one that was chosen to, to receive the priesthood and was chosen to approach before him. So if anyone's out there listening going, okay, I, I see Genesis 26.5, you, you did show, okay, I, I, the word charged, the Mismarty in the Hebrew, it it does mean to, to discharge a priestly office. So that, that makes sense for Abraham. But how do you know that for Isaac and Jacob? Well, I don't have. I didn't put up the Isaac in here, but specifically the Jacob part, so you can under, understand Jubilees thirty-two of how Jacob would take the priestly garments and give them to Levi. Right here, it's directly telling you that Jacob was chosen to approach the altar of the Lord. You have to be a priest to do that. Exodus twenty-eight forty-two and forty-three, same language for Aaron and his sons. Hundreds of years later, after Jubilees fifteen. Verse 42, you shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their bare flesh. They shall reach from the waist even to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place. This is the same language. The ministers are the ones who approach the altar. You, No one ever in the scriptures is described as approaching the altar of the Lord without being a priest and without an actual temple that houses the altar. We don't approach the altar of the Lord in a different setting. This is language that's directly and always dedicated to a priest in a physical literal building. So both the priest has to be ordained by Yahweh, and the physical literal building has to be ordained by Yahweh, and the altar itself has to be ordained and cleansed per the instructions of the law. For that priest to alter to approach Yahweh's altar and then minister on it, which means prepare the food on it. So this is all very important that we remember this information. Okay, so now eleven through twelve, it goes on to say, now if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on this basis the people received the law. Why was there still need for another priest to appear, in order of Melchizedek and not the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed as well. Philippians 3, 10 through 15. What does it mean to be perfect? What is this now verse? Now, if perfection could have been maintained through the Levitical priesthood. Philippians 3, 10 through 15. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to him in his death, and so somehow attained to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or already have been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straying toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take a view, should embrace this view, this point of view. 
perfection is at the resurrection. This is what Paul's saying. He is not there yet. He has not obtained this. He has not been made perfect. Of course, the Levitical priesthood could not make people perfect. It was never intended to. Hopefully that's clear. So let's look on the idea of the changed. What does it mean that for when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also? This is where preachers will say, see, look, the law's done away with. We have a new priest with Christ as a Melchizedek. Uh, and of course, they they add the added detail of uh, he did all of his priestly duties when he died on the cross, which that's not what a priest does. That's not how a priest makes atonement. But then they'll say, see, Christ is a new priesthood. Hebrews 7, 12 says there's a change in the law because we have a new priesthood. Case closed, law's done away with. Uh, go go give lip service to Christ and live your life however you want. Obviously, I'd be a little hyperbolic in my straw manning of that, but that is that. Unfortunately, you know, to some extreme, to some extreme teachings of free grace, that is exactly what we hear. Now, most preachers will tell you you need to you need to live. They call it holiness. They call it right living, but they. They get really squirmish when you start actually defining it from the commandments in the Old Testament. Sorry about that. Got it. Coughing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Something, something got my throat. So they will call, they will say, you know, put your faith in Christ, confess he is Lord. But then when you're asking for practical discipleship, it becomes subjective to their personal interpretation and opinions versus just going to the scriptures and saying, this is what God said is right behavior. Here's the commandments. So that it gets very confusing for a lot of people because they'll, people will say, well, the Old Testament, even Christ is saying that the law is eternal. This is what he discipled his disciples to do. This is what Christ says for all of his disciples to do. And they'll say, oh, no, no, no. Hebrews 7, 12 says, because he's a priest now, there's a change in the law. That was so that was before the cross. Now, after the cross, there's a change. What does this word actually say? As always, if we slow down, we define our terms. We, we cross-reference where these analogies and allegories are being pulled from. There's Greek lexicon, Strong's 33, 46. The word used, the first word used in verse 12 is a word to transfer or to change. To transfer. To transfer. And specifically, it's a passing of an office or passive of an office, the mode of conferring, which is changed. So the use of the word changed is not that it's annulled or done away with. It's transferred from one person to another. Let's look at the second use of the word changed in the very same verse. Oh, I'm sorry, but real quick, Merriam-Webster uh, is to confer. So this is of the same word, the first use of the word changed in verse 12. It says to give, to present, donate, bestow, confer, afford, means to convey to another as a possession. So what's been given, what's been donated, bestowed, conferred, and, and, and presented to someone else is not fundamentally changed in how it applies or its nature of how things work. It's the office of priesthood is given from one to another. That's all this is. Now, we go into this word in Strong's, uh, this is in Thayer's Greek lexicon, also in Strong's 3331. It's the same, it's a different Greek word used in change. It says the law must be changed as well. Now, this word changed is used in some cases for disestablishment, which means that basically you would unestablish the law of God for priests ministering at temple. But that's not its first and only definition. Its first definition is to transfer it, just like the other word used. So if we're looking at a hermeneutic approach to interpretation, we have two different Greek words used in the same sentence for the priesthood being changed and the law being changed. The definitive, unquestioned, only use of the word change in the first instance, the priesthood, is conferred, the priesthood is given, is the priesthood is transferred to someone else, then the law must be transferred as well. You would never say this the law by which the priesthood operates is unestablished or disestablished just because it was given to somebody else. 
because we don't see that. Why? Because Christ remains a priest forever ministering in a temple in heaven. Otherwise, you have no point of a priest ministering and approaching the altar of Yahweh because that is Yahweh's law. That's his instructions. All the language denotes it's a transfer. All the context denotes it's a transfer. The majority of definitions would denote it's a transfer. This is not this would be pointless to make Christ a priest forever ministering in the temple of the most high God if there's no law to minister. Then that means if there's no law then Christ couldn't be receiving our confession of sins. Throw 1 John 1:9 1, out the window. Now we now we have to call into question the legitimacy of John the apostle because now he's teaching a false doctrine. If that's the interpretation you try to make out of this Greek word in verse 12, you have to then go throw out Isaiah, future prophecy of the law still being enacted, taught to all nations, sacrifices and burnt offerings being accepted by Yahweh in his house of prayer. You have to throw out Ezekiel and his whole second temple vision with the river of life and the trees of life flowing out of it to water the nations. You have to, and all the, pre, the priestly duties that minister in there, you have to throw out Ezekiel, you have to throw out Isaiah, you have to throw out Jeremiah, you have to throw out Christ himself, you have to throw out the Apostle John. If you try to make a new spurious doctrine based off of a, a, um, a minority interpretation of this only singular Greek word, Strong's 3331, of this particular one and ignore its other congruent definition to transfer, but instead you want to make an entire new doctrine off of one of its uses of disestablishment to try to say that the entire law is done away with, well, then you should not be upset if one of your congregants comes up and wants to take your wife for the night. Law is done away with. So this is the extent that people will go to to, to defend bad doctrine. The law is eternal. The priesthood is eternal. Christ himself, who lives forever, remains a priest for all time. Never going away. So the first use of the word change is to transfer. The second use of the word change is also to transfer. So the priesthood, the office is transferred to Christ. And then the instructions for how that priest ministers and approaches the altar is transferred to Christ. Hebrews 7, 13 through 17. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. At the altar. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe as to which Moses said nothing about priests. And this point is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not by law of succession, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is testified, you're a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. So, he of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. So that's true. That's the idea that when you're speaking about the context of the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Israel, Jacob, the tribe of Judah was not given the priesthood. They were given the rulership. So the tribe of Levi was the only ones that were. So he's, he's making, again, remember, why is he? Why does he keep going back to this paradigm of, of whom Moses said? It's, it, to me, it's very interesting that because he's speaking to people who are being taught that the law only came at Mount Sinai through Moses, which is a like a first century rabbinical reinterpretation of the old testament it was a part of their rabbinic teachings what they were reframing restructuring how people understood the old testament and it was not true and it's what they still hold to today so he's having to again he's having to remind them and draw into what they know and what they've been taught poorly to break that down, use it inside the analogies and the comparisons while it help them understand the truth and why Christ can be a high priest forever. Verse 14, for it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe as to which Moses said nothing about priests. That's true. And this point is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, 
one who has become a priest not by law of succession, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it's testified you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So again in the Testament of Levi, chapter 8, verses 11 through 15, he goes on to say, And they said to me, Levi, your seed shall be divided into three offices for a sign of the glory of the Lord to come. And the first portion shall be great, truly greater than it shall, be, than, than it shall none be. The second shall be in the priesthood, and the third shall be called by a new name, because a new king shall arise in Judah and shall establish a new priesthood to all the nations. And his presence is beloved as a prophet of the Most High, of the seed of Abraham our father. Would it be amazing if you had this testimony, this prophecy, if you're in the first century and people are trying to tell you that the priesthood only came through Levi and that Christ is disqualified for the priesthood? Wouldn't this prophecy be important for you to have access to, to compare the false line claims of the Pharisees of the first century? I'll read it again in verse 14. The third should be called a new name because the king shall arise in Judah and shall establish a new priesthood to all the nations. And his presence is beloved as a prophet of the Most High. Christ was a prophet of his father, the Most High, and of a seed of the father of Abraham, our father. Christ was the descendant through the line of Judah, of Abraham. Pretty amazing to me. Pretty important information why first century believers are going and testifying that Christ is risen. He's in heaven. He's at the temple in heaven ministering in the Melchizedek priesthood, not because the priesthood of the Levites is for mortal men on the earth. But remember, there was a conflict in the first century. There was new teachings happening. There was mass censorship and suppression in order to, to, them, to get people to stop believing in Christ. And this was one of the tactics, was to say that, oh, he can't be a priest. He's not from the life of, of Levi. And then when you ask, like I did, I asked the rabbi, well, what, who's the Melchizedek? Eh, we don't, no one knows. No, no one knows. Okay, did he minister the law of God? No, no, the law of God showed up at Sinai. Well, then what's he doing? What's the Melchizedek doing in Genesis 14? The book that you claim Moses wrote. What's, what's the, the Melchizedek doing? He's a priest of the most high God. What's a priest do? Well, the priests, the high priests are only from Aaron. Why is it calling this guy a high priest? No one knows. Yeah, we do know. You just refuse to admit it. The scriptures directly tell us. No wonder Christ called them liars and vipers. Hebrews 7, 18 through 22. So the former commandment is set aside because it was weak and unprofitable. What, what former commandment? All the law of God? No. The one about mortal men who cannot make you perfect. Mortal men, earthly priesthood, can't make you perfect. Never was intended to. Never was prophesied to. What was the prophecy we just read? The third shall be called by a new name. That's a new authority. You know, the priesthood that Christ received was given him all authority in heaven and earth. The Levites didn't have that. They had, a, they had a name, they had an authority over Israel only on the earth. Christ has been given all authority in heaven and earth. He's got that new name that he talks about in Revelation 3. Because a king shall arise in Judah, the descendancy from where Christ came, and shall establish a new priesthood to all nations. It's pretty amazing because at an appointed time when at second coming, he's going to rule over all nations and under Christ's authority will be his resurrected saints who also are in that priesthood with him who will rule over all nations and teach them how to live in righteousness. This is amazing, guys. This is truly a blessing. This, this is the prophecy for the eschatology of the millennial reign, the second coming, all right here in the Testament of Levi that rabbinic Judaism in the first century decided to ignore. Very interesting. So the former commandment is set aside because it's weak and unprofitable. Can the Levites ministering at the altar, can they create resurrection for you, which is the perfection? For 19, look, for the law made nothing perfect, complete, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. 
The better hope is Christ, his priesthood. He lives forever. He's got the priesthood forever. He's in the temple in heaven because he's been given a glorified body that can exist up there. He can minister and approach the altar of Yahweh to make atonement now and then resurrection at the appointed time. This is the hope to which we draw near to God, to when we'll be made perfect. Verse 20, none of this happens without an oath. Why? Because Christ was given an oath by the Most High that he would be made a priest forever. That was never spoken of of the Levites. Verse 21, but Jesus became a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So let's look real quick. Um, so again, the former commandment was weak, set aside. The Levites can't, the, the Levitical priesthood was made of men and the descendancy of men. They were all going to die. Their offices were never intended to be, to have the authority to give you resurrection and fulfill the covenant. It was all, and it's told to us in Hebrews two different times. They were practicing what is really taking place in heaven. They were serving in a copy and a shadow. It was still important. It was still considered righteousness if they did it. They were still punished whenever they failed or whenever they profaned Yahweh's name and took his name in vain and did their jobs with duplicitousness or with unrighteousness. There were still consequences, just like there's still consequences in all other manners of sin. But it's told to us from the get-go, from the days Moses went up the mountain and saw the pattern he was supposed to make. He patterned it after what's already in heaven. They were to make a copy on the earth so that they could practice. And it goes into explain the difference in the in the uh, the seriousness, if you will, <laughs> as the father anointed Levi and his descendants forever to be priests among men on the earth through genealogy, not through an oath, because the oath is more powerful. The oath extends into even if you die, guess what? You're going to be a priest forever, because your oath is when you're resurrected. So this is why it says you'd sworn and not the word oath is also used for the word swore. You swore and will not change his mind. You were a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It was Psalm 110, 1 through 4. It's going to be repeated in Hebrews chapter 8, but here's a um <clears throat> here's a, a quick summation of it in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20. None of this happened without an oath. For for others became priests without an oath. Those are the Levites. And those are even the, the previous Melchizedeks, like Abraham. And whoever before him, Genesis 14, I know a lot of people like to speculate it's Shem, could have been, it doesn't matter. There were plenty of Melchizedek's. Depends on if you're righteous and wanted to serve Yahweh. Verse 22, because of this oath, Jesus became a guarantee of a better covenant. This oath is found in Psalm 110, verse 4. This is why it's such a big deal. It's an oath. It's not just a, oh, here's a genealogical requirement for who's the next priest. It's an oath. This specific person will be a priest forever and minister and approach my altar. So he has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Jesus is metaphored as the new covenant because he's a guarantee of it to come. But there's a qualifier for when this happens, and we see this laid out in prophecy. Again, like I said, we can call him our Passover lamb. We can call him our atonement. We can call him our eternal covenant. We can call him a representative, who the one who represents the new covenant being initiated or inaugurated because he already received the new covenant with his resurrection body. He's the forerunner ahead of us, as Hebrews 7 says later. I think it's verse 24. But there's a timing. There's a, there's a process for when the new covenant takes effect, and it's at resurrection, eternal life resurrection, not the Lazarus resurrection because Lazarus unfortunately died again. <laughs> It's the eternal life promise, which is the fulfillment of the covenant between man and God. That's when you get your eternal life, and that's when the quote-unquote new covenant kicks in, when you have his laws and ordinances put on in your heart so that you always faithfully do them. Christ has already received that. That's why it says he's the one who inaugurated the new covenant. We haven't died and been resurrected to eternal life yet. We have not received that. First Enoch chapter 60, verse 6 says, And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment comes, which the Lord of spirits has prepared for those who worship not the righteous law, and for those who deny the righteous judgment, and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared. 
For the elect, they'll be given a covenant. But for sinners, they'll be given inquisition. When the punishment of the Lord of Spirits shall rest upon them, it shall rest in order that the punishment of the Lord of Spirits may not come in vain. And it shall slay the children and with their mothers, the children with their fathers, and afterwards the judgment shall take place according to his mercy and his patience. So the wheat, or excuse me, the, uh, the tares, they're judged first, they're burned. The wheat, they're judged with mercy and patience. Sheep and the goats. The goats are rounded up, killed, destroyed. The go the uh excuse me, the, yeah, the goats and then the sheep are, are shown mercy and spared. In the same way, those who are given uh for the elect, those who are raised in the in the first resurrection, they're given a covenant. It's the new covenant. Your incorruptible heart and body of the of the resurrection is what's given the law and ordinance of God that you faithfully do them. So this is why we see in the prophecy in Isaiah 42, chapter verse 1 and also verse 6 and 7, Christ is referenced as a covenant for the people. Verse 1, here is my servant whom I have upholded, in, my chosen one. That's a word that means elect, just like we saw in 1 Timothy 60. Christ is the elect one of God as well. He's the capital elect one. In whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. In verse 6, it says, I, Yahweh, have called you for a righteous purpose. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring prisoners out of the dungeon and those sitting in darkness out from the prison house. Christ is the only one that fulfills these descriptors. Christ is the one who's given as a covenant for the nations because he's the one who mediates, who brings you into the new covenant at your resurrection, not before then. That's the point. That's why he can be saying he's inaugurated the, the, resur the new covenant. He is already experiencing the resurrected body that we're going to get. We haven't received that yet because the day of judgment has not come, as First Enoch 60 talks about. This day of judgment, the day of power, of punishment, the judgment that comes from the Lord of Spirits, he's prepared for those who worship not the righteous law. That's the second coming. That's what we see at the end of Hebrews 7, verse 28 and 29. Excuse me, um, verse, Hebrews 9, verse 27 and 28, where it talks about Christ's first coming came to bear, to bear sins, and the second coming will be for judgment. That's the day of the Lord, the great day of judgment. That's when the elect are given a covenant. It's the new covenant you get through Christ because he's resurrected to this glorified body with God's ordinances and laws put on your heart. Hebrews 7, 23 through 28. Now there have been many other priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly befits us, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, set apart from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priests, excuse me, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for sin once for all when he offered himself up. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who's been made perfect forever. People will take this verse in verse 27, they'll mix it with verse 7, uh, verse 12 in the same chapter, the one that says there's a change in the priesthood and there's a change of the law, and then they'll go right to verse 26 and say, see, look, he doesn't have to sacrifice like the others did daily for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because there's because the law was changed. His priesthood, you don't do sacrifices. Well, then what is he ministering at the altar? It's it's truly amazing. It's truly, it's, it's truly amazing. So we're going to address these verses. We'll address them. We'll break them down. Verse 23 and 24. Now, there have been many other priests since death prevented them from continuing office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Okay, so he's a, so we have established again. He's a permanent priesthood. He lives forever. He's never not going to be a priest. He will always be a priest, ministering in God's house because he lives forever, and his priestly appointment does not end. He makes this statement. Okay. So therefore, he's able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Again, permanent priesthood. He's a priest who remains for all time. He always lives to intercede for them. Actively, how do you intercede for somebody? You don't need to intercede from someone who's not sinned. You only intercede for someone who has sinned. That's how you create atonement for them. 
All right. So if we understand the definitions of these terms, a priest ministers in a temple who intercedes for people who have transgressed. Let's then we'll get to 27 and we'll, we'll start to see, wait a minute. Is it really saying what people interpret it to say? So look at Strong's. So this is the word pentelis. It's actually a, a mixture of pen and telos, which is to complete or the entirety of or the uttermost um, through all time. So this is where he says, therefore, he is able to save completely. This is very interesting, guys. This is a, this is a contrast to those who were not saved completely under a different priesthood, under a different high priest. Like it says earlier, the Levitical priesthood was never intended to make someone perfect. It says that in verse 19. They couldn't be made perfect through the political priesthood. They could not be saved completely. They could be they could they could be atoned for in this life, and then they go to the righteous side of Sheol to await the only one who could actually resurrect them. This is this is how he can save us completely, is we get resurrected to eternal life and get the promise of the covenant. Otherwise, we're atoned for. It's our sin is covered over but our sin is not removed. We're going to get to that in a couple of videos later in chapter 10, where it goes in a great effort to break you down the difference between atoning for your sin versus removal of sin. To be saved completely is to have your sin removed. You get a new heart, new body. It's incorruptible. That means there's no sin inside. You never transgress the law. You never offend Yahweh. You're in peace with him forever. This is the promise of the covenant, how you can live in his house with him and his son forever and be at peace. You'll never transgress again. You'll never sin again. You're saved completely. 1 Timothy 4, 15 through 16. Be diligent in these matters and absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and to your teaching. Preserve in these things, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Uh-oh, is Paul telling you this is an ongoing process? The same Paul who, who wrote Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. The same, the same Paul that people take out of context and claim that he's just preaching that all you got to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. Your actions, the rest of your life doesn't actually have to matter and match up. That's people taking Paul out of context. That's people coming to false erroneous conclusions on what Paul's teaching. Because there's plenty of other passages where Paul is very clear that you must be faithful to death. You cannot shrink back. You must continue in your faith, actively guarding your life and your teachings. Persevere in these things, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, you're not clearly saving yourself. Paul is also preaching Christ. He knows that Christ is the high priest who actually does the one that atones for your sins and resurrects you to eternal life. But this is how you can ensure that you're in faith with Christ is that you actually guard your life and your teachings, that you can save both yourself and those who hear you. And that word save is the word preserve, by the way. Why would you be preserved? Because you're not saved completely until you're resurrected. You're only atoned for. You're only covered temporarily. At the resurrection is when all your sins are removed from you and you're saved completely. Colossians chapter 1, 20, 21, 23, Paul says, Once you were alienated from God, you were hostile in your minds, engaged in evil deeds. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical de body through death to present you holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence. If Can anyone right now tell me they're holy, unblemished, and blameless? Only Catholics who preach imputed righteousness, which is a false made-up idea. But if you're honest with yourself and you believe 1 John 7 and 8, Anyone who claims he's without sin is a liar. This is why we need atonement. So we need to confess our sins. When are we presented to Christ as holy, um, that's set apart, unblemished, that's without sin and blameless, that's without sin or guilt, and in the presence of him, literally in the presence of God? That's at the resurrection. We're not there yet. All these are promises for the resurrection. Christ's death of his physical body allowed him to be resurrected, given his priesthood, ascend to heaven, minister at the altar for your atonement, which is interceding for your sins, and then give you resurrection on the day of the Lord. 
so that you can be presented holy and blemished and blameless in the presence of God. We're, we're gonna, he talks about it in Revelation 3. We're going to hit it in just a minute. Verse 23 goes on to say in Colossians 1, If indeed you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope of the gospel you heard, which has ever been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, one of which I, Paul, become a servant. So the caveat is you are presented holy and blemished and blameless in his presence if, the big word if, you continue in your faith, established and firm. So in the very concept, he's telling you you're not there yet. You get there at the resurrection. That's when Paul is going to be made perfect. The thing he says he hasn't attained yet in Philippians 3 is the thing he's mentioning here, saying to them, if you want to attain that perfection, continue in your faith, establish and firm, and move not from the hope of the gospel. Then you will be holy, blameless, and unblemished. Then, not now. There's an if in between. John chapter 3, 35 and 36, Jesus said, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in, that is, has faith in, the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So here he's telling you right here, you, you believe in the Son, you'll have eternal life. If not, the wrath of God abides on you. It's a process. We're not at the eternal life part yet. Same thing with 1st Enoch 5. This is this is the Christ statement is after 1st Enoch 5 was written. Many, many, many years after. So the prophet Enoch already, already said the same concept of what Christ was preaching in John 3. He says in 1st Enoch 5, 8, and 9, And then there shall be bestowed upon the elect wisdom, and they shall all live and never again sin, either through ungodliness or through pride, but they who are wise shall be humbled. This is that wonderful promise of the resurrection. You have a new incorruptible heart and body. You shall live and never again sin. There's no animosity. There's no transgression. There's no need for someone to intercede for you as far as sin atonement or a guilt offering because you won't need those things. But there's plenty of other plenty of other reasons for the temple and the priesthood and for the joyous celebrations for thank offerings and vow offerings and all the other reasons that we would go and worship at God's house in which a priesthood is required. Verse 9, They shall not again transgress, nor shall they sin all the days of their life, nor shall they die of the divine anger or wrath. Remember Jesus said, if you don't believe in the Son of God, the wrath of God still abides on you. Those who are living again and are given wisdom will never sin again. There's no wrath of God to abide on them. But they shall complete the number of days of their life, and their life shall be increased in peace, and the years of their joy shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and peace all the days of their life. A lot of people get confused because it says the number of days of their life will be complete. Again, that's it, it qualifies to tell you now they have eternal gladness and life and peace. This is the promise of the covenant. The promise of the new covenant spoken in through the prophet Enoch from before the flood. Ezekiel 36, 27, 26, 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes to carefully observe my ordinances. This is, every pastor will tell you, this is a description of the new covenant. Simultaneously, those pastors will tell you, we don't have to do the ordinances and statutes of Yahweh. Those are done away with. This is the confusion modern Christianity has been swindled into believing. The devil's a liar. That's why we try to preach the truth. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 49. Paul also goes on to explain this process. 42. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Listen up, Trinitarians. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's a spiritual body. That's a heavenly body, a celestial body, if you will. The spiritual, however, was not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was the dust of the earth. The second man was from heaven. As was the earthly man, so also are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we currently have been born in the likeness of the earthy man, so also then shall we bear the likeness of the heavenly man. 
This is why Christ is considered the first fruits of the first resurrection. He's considered the forerunner of those of us who are already inaugurated the new covenant. We're not there yet. We haven't been given an imperishable body with God's ordinances and statutes written on it. That's why we still learn them. We don't just instinctively know them. Such a high priest truly befits us, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, set apart from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Holy is the word set apart. He is set apart. His righteous behavior is without sin, Hebrews 4.15. He's innocent. He was without sin. Grew in the wisdom, stature, and favor of God and man. He, had, he did everything his father told him to do. He had his father's doctrine, John 7.16. He accomplished everything his father asked him, John 17.4 and 5. Uh, he had his father's commandments, John 15.8-11. He did those perfectly. He was without sin. He was innocent. He was undefiled. He didn't defile himself with the blood of women through unrighteous uh, copulation. He was he's set apart from sinners. He's now been glorified and taken from mankind into heaven's temple to intercede for the sins of Israel. Those are the sins of those who are repentant and put their faith and trust in God through Jesus Christ. And he's exalted above the heavens. The word exalted means he's been given a place by the Father of honor into a position of priesthood. This is exactly what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, 32 and 33. And he's not exalted on the earth. This is the important part. He's not exalted on the ground like a high priest of the Levites. He's been given that position above the heavens. Verse 27. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for sin once for all when he offered up himself. A lot of people say PSA doctrines, you know, proponents love this verse because of the way it sounds, they think, oh, well, see, look, his death, when he offered himself on the cross, his death became some became a sacrifice for people and made propitiation. But God does not work like that. And the entirety, the entirety, please, please listen closely, everyone. The entirety of the Bible does not describe atonement through a priest dying on a cross. The entirety of the Bible talks about a priest and a process for how he bears your sins or how he makes atonement for you. If Christ had died on the cross and that simple act had made atonement, he would not be made a priest afterwards. There'd be no need. Atonement comes through the priesthood. This is why Hebrews 2.17 directly tells us that. Atonement is made through the priesthood. Hebrews 2.17. Let's go down the list, shall we? For this reason, he had been made like his brothers in every way, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. Does that line up with what people think Hebrews 7.27 is saying? People get confused because in, in the passage in Hebrews 7.27, it says, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. The writer of Hebrews is laying out the process. The high priest would make sins for his own, for himself and his family first. This is in Exodus 16, excuse me, Leviticus 16. And then he would make atonement for the sins of the people. So he'd have to atone for himself and his household first. And then make atonement for the sins of people. He's not saying that he doesn't have to make atonement to intercede for the sins of the people. He's giving you the process of before he makes atonement for the sins of the people, he had to make atonement for himself and his household. So because it's lumped, but that process is lumped together as one clause, people think that he no longer makes atonement for the sins of the people. But let's look at all the other places that tell you directly Christ is making atonement for the sins of the people ongoing in service to God in a temple in heaven. Hebrews 2.17, for this reason, he has to be made like his brothers in every way so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God in order to stand there and look at the Father and just verbally say they're good in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. That's what it says. Not to change the law. The law is not changed. We already looked at that passage. We already looked at the Greek word. Not to take away 
from the importance of his death on the cross. The death on the cross got him to his priesthood, ascended to heaven, ordained as a priest in Father's house, his tabernacle, his temple, to minister for the atonement of the sins of the people. After his resurrection, which is three days after his death, after, well, actually, technically, it's 40 days until he ascended to heaven. So 43 days after he died on the cross, he ascended to heaven. And if the law is kept on earth, kept in heaven as, as it's instructed to be kept on earth, like God says, then he went through a seven-day ordination process once he got to, to heaven. So then technically 50 days after he died on the cross, he is the, the high priest of heaven and earth. He finished his ordination. Now he can minister sins. And I don't know, is it a coincidence that Pentecost happens? And then he, Peter says on the day of Pentecost that he, these gifts of the Spirit you see is from Christ who's been exalted. And he's pouring out these gifts. Is it possible that his very first day of becoming high priest in heavenly, heaven's temple, he's like, oh, I got access to the Spirit of God now. Boom. Here you go, guys, on the earth. Told you I was going to give it to you. All of, all of this language cannot be dismissed because people take a clause and think, oh, well, because it included in the clause and then for the sins of the people, that he no longer makes atonement for the sins of the people. It's The clause has included the process for the earthly priests, how they covered their sins first before they covered the sins of the people. It's not saying that he sacrificed himself once for all and offered himself up, so therefore no more intercession for the sins of the people is required. We're going to go on to show you Hebrews 5, 9 through 10. It's still required. It's still happening. It's still necessary. God's law is eternal. We just have to understand the Old Testament and the process that's being compared to, just like the rest of this entire chapter. If you don't understand the process that is that Christ's priesthood is being compared to, then you're going to make wild assumptions and draw erroneous conclusions and create whole new doctrines that profanes the name of the Lord. This is why it's important that we understand the front of our Bibles. We take the time as discipled, studied, and approved men and women and go read the front of our Bibles. Hebrews 5, 9 through 10. And having been made perfect, what when, when did we just describe and explain all that? He was made perfect at his resurrection. Just like you and I received perfection at the resurrection. Christ was made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him and was designated by God as high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So only after his resurrection was he made his priest, so that Hebrews 2, 17, he could be a high priest in service to God in order to make atonement for the people. His death on the cross got him to his priesthood. His literal physical blood and torturous death being happening on the cross is not how the Father makes atonement for people. It is, analog it is uh, allegorized. It is metaphorized. It is made unto a comparison statement as a quick reference that his death on the cross makes atonement for us and made atonement for our sins. But there's a much, there's all these other details that explain the fullness of the process aside from those literary devices. And here we have him staring us in the face in the book of Hebrews emphatically. Hebrews 6, 19 through 20. So we already got chapter 2, chapter 5. Let's go into chapter 6. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. <laughs> Excuse me. Where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, guys. I should have, should have pressed mute before I cough. There is the, the very verse here. Is he really in a temple in heaven? Literally, Jesus, our forerunner, has entered where? In the sanctuary behind the curtain. Christ is not a priest on earth. He didn't enter in the sanctuary on the top of Solomon's temple on earth. The one that was re remodeled by Herod. He entered in the tabernacle in heaven. A real tabernacle. This is this Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. He became a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. 
The word high priest has a term. The, the Melchizedek order is, is, has a definition, is a term that has a real concrete, substantial meaning. The word sanctuary is a term that has real, concrete, substantial meaning. This is not a metaphor. We can trust as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We can trust this hope that we have. The, the word hope is, is the metaphor for Christ in this passage. This hope, it enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. So as Jesus enters into the sanctuary behind the curtain, so therefore our hope goes in with him because he's going to be a high priest forever to bring us eternal life. Chapter 7, 18, 21. We've already said this stuff. I've already went over it, but I just I want to show you a complete breakdown. For people that try to take chapter 7, verse 27 out of context to say, look, because he offered himself up, he does not have to make atonement for other people's sins anymore. That God's entire process for sin and atonement has been changed. Sorry, guys, one second. I'm sorry. I'm a little coughing. <clears throat> this is why I don't, I don't get excited too often. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm back. So for those who want to take these things out of context, they want to ignore the definitions of the words in Hebrews 7.12 and say the priesthood and the law are both changed because Christ is now... Priest, they ignore the definition of the word priest. They ignore the definitions of the word changed in Hebrews 7.12. They ignore the definitions of the word temple, tabernacle, sanctuary. They ignore the definitions of the word heaven, where Jesus went. <coughs> they ignore all these definitions so they can make up a new doctrine. Hebrews 7.18-21. So the former commandment set aside because it's weak and useless. This is the transfer of the priesthood. The, the, the Levites will be set aside because the temple is about to be destroyed. He actually goes on to expound upon this in chapter 8. We'll get into that next time. Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. We just talked about this. Christ, who was made perfect after his resurrection, became a high priest forever. Not before then. <clears throat> and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. So there was not it, the Levitical priesthood was not the better hope. Christ in his Melchizedek priesthood, who ministers in heaven's temple, is our better hope. None of this happened without an oath, for others became priests without an oath, but Jesus became a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you're a priest forever. Well, if you actually read the, the fullness of that passage in Psalm 110, verse 1, not verse 4, this is quoting verse 4, but if you read verse 1, it says, Yahweh said to my Adonai, so the Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies of, till I make your, your enemies a, um, a footstool for your feet. Basically meaning until I put all your enemies under your feet. That's the day the Lord when he comes down to fight the battle of Armageddon. <coughs> and in verse 4 of the same passage of Psalm 110, he goes on to announce the oath of making him a high priest forever. So after he's exalted to the heavens, in the prophecy of Psalm 110, after he's exalted to the heavens and sits at the right hand of the Father, then he's made a priest. Not beforehand. He's not a priest while he's on the earth. He's a priest afterward. He does not make atonement while he was on the earth. He makes atonement afterward. Once he goes to heaven, he becomes a priest. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 through 2. The point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who ministers in the sanctuary in true tabernacle set up by the Lord and not by man. The word minister, what are we talking about? Those who approach at the altar minister to Yahweh. The word, the word high priest is the definition. The, the word throne of the majesty in heaven is literal, tangible Trinitarians. Adherence to Greek philosophy. God has a real body, has a real throne. The son's sitting beside it in his priestly position, ready to minister in, for his duties when ready for the temple. 
The sanctuary in heaven is a real technical word with concrete meaning. Same thing for a true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. That's the point of the tabernacle on the earth being a replica. Hebrews 8, 4, and 5. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there were already priests who offered gifts according to the law. Guys, remember this verse. Put it in your, in your bag. Every time anyone tells you, oh, Christ's priesthood was when he walked around the earth. Christ's priesthood was when he died on the cross. All that out of context, poor reinterpretation of men, bring this verse up to them, impossible. The very words of God through Hebrews says he was not a priest on the earth. There are already those, there are already priests who offer gifts according to the law. That's the Levites. Christ could not have and was not a priest while on the earth, only after he went to heaven. I will stress that forever. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that are to come, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made by hands and that is not a part of this creation. A real tabernacle, not a part of the earth in heaven above. Christ appeared as high priest in that. All this timing, all these qualifiers are synonymous. Verse 12, he did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but guess what? He did enter. He actually physically went into a real tabernacle in heaven. He did enter something. It's a real sanctuary that God had made, that the Father made. And he didn't enter with the blood of goats and calves. This is what Hebrews 7.27 on the left-hand side is talking about. He did not need to offer daily sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. But he needed, he needed to get there do his own righteousness, he could just walk in without making atonement for himself because he doesn't need it. He's not transgressed. He's, and even what's more, he's been glorified, resurrected with a perfect body, and he'll never transgress. He is holy, undefiled, set apart, exalted above the heavens. He will never ever need an animal to atone for him before he can step before the Father. He, unlike the other high priests on the earth who are full of sin, and beset with weaknesses. He doesn't need that. He walks right in so he can minister for the people. Otherwise, there's no job for him to do. This is <laughs> this is what's so important for people to understand. Hebrews 7.27 is a clause, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. It doesn't mean that, that the new high priest is going to stop interceding in service to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. It's just talking about the process of before the, the high priest could minister for the sins of the people. He had to take care of himself so he didn't die, stepping before the Lord. Christ doesn't have to worry about that. He doesn't have to atone for his own sin. He doesn't have any sin. Not on the earth and the flesh, nor, especially not now, glorified and resurrected. He can just walk right in confidently and minister for our transgressions. It's very simple, guys. Uh, let me finish the passage. Hebrews 9, 11, Hebrews 9, 12. He did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. It goes on to tell you that if he continued, if he did need to use blood um, animals in order to sanctify himself before he can enter, he would have had to, it gives the analogy, he would have had to die over and over again on the cross. We're going to go over that when we get to chapter 9. Like I said, I'm already... I'm already run up here at the almost two hour mark. I'm going to have to stop soon. I knew that I wouldn't be able to cover cover chapter seven, eight, and nine in one setting. I had to break it up. But thankfully, you'll have all these. That's why I'm even willing to include a verse from chapter nine ahead of time because it matters. It directly matters to understanding chapter seven, verse 27. The once and for all by his own blood is him stepping into his priesthood, entering into that real sanctuary in heaven to begin his, his priestly duties. He doesn't have to go through the agony of the cross again to get to that priesthood. That's a once and for all sacrifice. He offered his body up once and for all to get to his priesthood. Not to change the way the Father makes atonement for people. He continues to do the same process for how the Father makes atonement for people. His appointment wasn't through succession. His appointment was through resurrection, and an oath from the Father that cannot be broken, that he will be made a high priest in the Melchizedek order after his resurrection. 
that's why you get the idea of offering himself up once for all. Because now that he's up there, he doesn't have to go through that again on the cross. Now he lives forever. He remains a priest for all time. Hebrews 9, 23 and 24. So it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So this is probably one of the most overlooked verses in all of the scriptures. In a direct comparison that there's a true tabernacle in heaven, which people struggle to believe because they've been told that it can't be real, that heaven's not a real place. A copy was made on the ground that the Levites served in. And just as the copy on the ground was to be purified with sacrifices, so the heavenly the heavenly tabernacle will be purified with better sacrifices. Christ did not enter a man-made copy of the true sanctuary, but he entered heaven itself. Why? Because in heaven, at the, at the top of the firm, at the most highest level, is the actual true sanctuary. He entered heaven itself to get to the true sanctuary, not the copy on the ground. Now to appear on our behalf in the presence of God. Did God say when my when I make my son a high priest? Did God remember? God does nothing without first telling his servants, right? As Amos does. God's not going to change the way he does things without telling his prophets first. In the prophets of the Old Testament, when prophesying Christ will become a high priest, did God ever say, and by the way, whenever Christ is made, when I make him a high priest and fulfill the oath I've sworn, um, he's going to do his priesthood duties completely different than anybody else. Instead of making intercession through this process I've laid out that I called holy, righteous, and good, um, I'm going to change all that. And instead, all he has to do is just come show me his face and I'm and I'm happy. Now, what people will do to try to intimidate you is they'll tell you, because they've been taught PSA doctrine, <coughs> excuse me, they'll tell you, oh, you're denigrating the cross of Christ by claiming that his sacrifice didn't do away with the Levitical systems of sacrifice. That's just made up. That's just a made up claim. Purely made up. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that the sacrifices, the entire temple process, the sanctuary in heaven, that, that none of it is applicable or as it's described, and that all is going to be changed because Christ died on the cross. None of it. But they'll take verses like Hebrews 7.27 to try to make that claim without knowing the process of the comparison being made with the Levitical moral, moral priests. So let's go Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way open for us through the curtain of his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, this isn't even a comparison statement of any kind. This is just a direct declarative fact. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's a tabernacle, that's a sanctuary, the true one that's in heaven. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It, over and over and over and over again, the writer of Hebrews tells you there's a real temple in heaven. There's a real priesthood happening. There is a real entering of the Son into that temple to make atonement for you. Over and over and over again. All of these definitions matter. We do not have any heavenly license through any prophet or any angelic appearance to tell us that we can reinterpret all of these words in Hebrews to make it a metaphor and to make it, oh, you're the temple. Christ entered you. He ministers inside of you. The word minister doesn't mean what it used to. It means something new now. Like We don't have license for that. God did not give mankind that, that interpretive cipher. That is the doctrines of men. That is the deception of the enemy through confused men. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. These were all commended for their faith, yet they did not receive what was promised. So all the people in verses 1 through 38 of Hebrews 11, all the wonderful patriarchs and men of faith, who many of them received horrific deaths in martyrdom because of their faith. The writer of Hebrews is telling you, after he's already gone through all these comparisons about Christ, and Christ not receiving his priesthood until he gets perfected, 
at the resurrection. In chapter 11, verse 39 and 40, verse 40, he goes on to say, God planned something better for us so that together with us, they would be made perfect. He then explains that all these people that he mentioned all the way back to the, the early patriarchs before the flood up until the, the moment he's writing this statement, none of them have been perfected yet. So this erroneous doctrine that the moment Christ ascended to heaven, he took a whole bunch of resurrected people with him. It's not true. No one has been has received the promise of the first resurrection yet. Together, all at the same time, at the seventh trumpet on the day of the Lord, the day of his return, that's when the dead in Christ rise. All of us together will be perfected at the same time. Isaiah 66, 7 through 9, can a nation be born in a day? Yes, it will be. This is the promise of it. Read, read Isaiah 66 all the way through. <clears throat> so again, just like Paul says in Philippians 3, 10 through 12, he has not been perfected yet. He hopes to strive to attain it, but he has not been perfected yet. Only Christ has. 1 Timothy 2, 5, what is Christ actively doing for you? There is one God, there is one intercessor, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And yes, he gave himself up for all. This is what it says, just like it says in Hebrews 7.27. He sacrificed for sin once for all when he offered himself up. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony that was given just at the right time. Why was it just at the right time? Because the former commandment, which is weak and useless, was going away. The temple is about to be destroyed as prophesied. The Levi Levite priesthood was going to be dispersed as prophesied. So thankfully, we already have a priest in heaven who's still atoning for our sins and mediating us before God. Is Paul contradicting the writer of Hebrews 7? He's telling you that he's an active mediator between God and man right here. Is the definition of the word high priest and mediator suddenly changed? Did Paul give us new definitions somewhere? I've never seen it. 1 John 1, 7-9, is, is the apostle John going to also contradict the writer of Hebrews? Or is it just that we need to understand how priests work and, and that this was a clause phrase, that this isn't telling you that he eradicated the entire process for intercessory for sins just because he offered himself up on the cross? 1 John 1, 7-9, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his sons cleanses us from all sins. Does Jesus' blood literally cleanse you from sin? The blood that he spilled on the cross, which he doesn't have in his new body anymore. He doesn't actually have access to that blood. That all poured out and drained on the hill of Golgotha in the dirt. Jesus didn't resurrect and go scoop up that dirt and purify it and take it with him to heaven. That blood is out of, this is a metaphor. The blood represented his purity and his faithfulness to God. This is the idea, and again, if you understand your Old Testament, they had to bring an offering that had pure blood, one that was without blemish, just like Christ, who is perfectly obedient, is described as without blemish. You, When you come to faith in Christ and you start walking in the light as he is in the light, <clears throat> There is no you don't go you don't go to the back of the church where they have a, a blood cleansing ceremony and they and they take some of the Christ's blood and spray you down with a spray bottle or hose you off with a hose. This is a metaphor. How does he cleanse you from sin? Because he atones for you because of his righteous, perfect, faithful behavior. He was given his priesthood. This is what Hebrews 5, 7 through 10 talks about, like we just read. These are analogies, these are metaphors for Christ's obedience that got him to the position where he can atone for you and then resurrect you at the appointed time. This is how he's going to cleanse you from all sin. Give you a new heart, new body that's without sin. He removes your sin forever. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. I thought we were just cleansed from all sin in verse 7. Is John speaking du duplicitously here? Is John contradicting himself in the very next sentence? Or is he talking about faith? Is he talking about the understanding of Christ at the appointed time? If you know the process, he covers your sin now through atonement. He removes your sin at the resurrection on the day of the Lord at the first resurrection of all saints. And that's how you're cleansed from all sin. Right now you're atoned for because you're still sinning. Verse eight, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a process 
for your atonement and then your resurrection. Revelation 3, 11 through 12, even Christ acknowledges there's a future time where he's going to bring you into that temple that he went into. Isn't that exciting? It's a real temple. It's a real place. <laughs> Revelation 3, 11 through 12, I'm coming suddenly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never leave it. There it is. He entered a real temple in heaven. To do what? To just stare at the Father? No, he's in active service to God in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. Hebrews 8, 1 through 2. This, the point of what we're saying is this. That we do have a high priest who ministers in the true sanctuary, not built by man, but by the Lord. He minist actively ministers in the true sanctuary. He's a priest for all time forever. Verse 28, for the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who's been made perfect forever. Again, the time, just in, expounding on the time qualifier, on the sequential order, after Christ was resurrected, then the oath kicks in, he's made a priest forever. <clears throat> Sorry if I get a little fired up. Hebrews 7, uh, let's look at all the priestly context as we look at an overview of the entire chapter. What do you know? The entire chapter is trying to explain to you the priestly context of Christ Jesus in comparison to the mortal Levites. You get a little history lesson, you get a little comparisons and the difference in, in job duties because Christ doesn't have sin and how he doesn't have to cover for his own sin because he don't have any. The whole thing is telling you that he holds this position forever. He actively ministers in the temple in heaven. He, and he got that position when he offered himself up on the cross because after the cross, he's resurrected, taken to heaven, and given his priestly appointment because it was sworn by the Father that that's what would happen. So as we continue to unfold 7, 8, 9, we're going to compare the priestly context in red. Um, we haven't touched on 8 and 9 yet, so we'll do that in the following videos. So I hope you join us next time for um, chapter eight of the Servant King as we continue in this series. This is a highly contested topic, guys. The same people that the same people that tell you that you don't have to do the commandments of the Father, which he called eternal and holy, will also tell you that heaven's not a real place. They'll tell you the Father doesn't have a real body, that you'll never be able to see him. They tell you that the Father is now just basically all of his immutable traits are given to the son and so therefore the son is technically now the father but they'll never call him that but that's the way they describe him um they'll also tell you that uh if they're orthodox or catholics they'll, uh, roman catholics they'll tell you that they're the new priesthood on the earth you even have some protestants trying to claim that they're priests which is wild because they're not actual priests ministering in a temple they can they can LARP, they can imagine themselves to be priests and practice all they want, but that means you got to practice the law of God, not, not some new interpretive um, law of Christ concept. So th again, all this muddied waters of theology because people do not define basic words. We have this wealth of resources through the internet for Greek and Hebrew studies. And the same people, and they, they just refuse to define the terms because it goes against what, what their school teaches or what their seminary teaches, or you know, they're, they'll, they're afraid. They're afraid to be treated like they treat me for telling you these words have definitions and we should take those definitions seriously. And if we apply the definitions in the, in the story as they are without trying to reinterpret things, you get an extremely coherent story that builds your faith. I think people shrink back because they have extremely poor theology. They've been taught lies. And it truly doesn't make sense to them. So they're not grounded in their faith. That's my personal philosophy. So I want to just preach what, what the words say. I just want to declare those and and help people understand this is the context, is the definitions. List. I want to build your faith. So if persecution ever comes, you're never going to shrink back. You know the story. It's coherent. makes perfect sense. You had to come to a point 
where you believed it. This is why you hear me saying sometimes in conversations with pastors and people that come on the channel, I'll say, hey, man, whether you believe the Bible or not, that's a different story. But let's just talk about what it claims and let's see if we can believe that. See if we can believe or excuse me, agree on what it claims. And that's where you see these crazy conversations unfold, where you start to realize even pastors don't even believe or agree on the definitions of what it claims. They want to reinterpret it. But, and I would say personally, if it's not ignorance, it's from fear of men. They don't want the smoke. They don't want people laughing at them, mocking them. They don't want to have to defend something that the entire world will laugh at. Be honest with you. That's fear of men, in my opinion. That's why they'll stare at the definition and then try to tap dance in, in real time on a live stream. So we pray for them. We ask, may the Father give them courage. May, um, may they become brave believers as well. And that's what I consider all of you that are been with us for so long that uh, continue to test what we say, that, that, that are offering definitions right alongside me. I see you in the live chat um, defending the word. You know, I see you in, on social media defending the word. You guys are amazing. Truly encouragement. I never thought I'd see so many people adamantly trying to just simply, def, you know, explain what the Bible has been saying this whole time through the definitions of words. Like it's, you know, it's not the sexiest thing in the world. You know, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it definitely is not for tickling ears. Um, because, you know, the, the, the doctrine that tickles ears is the, the fanciful doctrines that they never define their terms and they conflate ideas and just, you know, try to make a show of their teaching so that people get excited, but trying to come along and say, Hey man, let's look at the definition of the word. Let's try to define it in context and look at its other uses and find consistency of use. And it's, it's such a basic hermeneutic that it's not, it's, it's not flamboyant. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't get you a lot of views. It doesn't attract, um, it doesn't attract the masses. So I'm just super proud to see so many other people along with us that are continuing to, to, to be faithful to this type of most rudimentary her hermeneutic. Um, and many times it comes with a lot of uh, persecution. And this particular topic as well, because they, on one side of their mouth, they'll say Christ is a priest. The other side of their mouth, they'll say his priesthood's over. One side of the mouth will say, oh, yeah, Christ is a priest. The other side of the mouth will say, well, but he's not ministering the law because the law is done away with. The other, one side of the mouth will say, oh, yeah, Christ is a priest in the heaven's temple. Sure. The other side of the mouth will say, but heaven's temple is now your body. Your gross, defiled, unholy body. <laughs> uh, it's a wild world we live in. May he come quickly. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next time for Chapter 8. Bye-bye.